Welcome to this webinar. My name is Dr. Tara McCannell, and I'm an ophthalmologist and director of the Ocular Oncology Center at the Stein Eye and Doheny Eye Institutes at UCLA. Today, we're going to be talking about prevention as part three of this three-part series on eye cancer surgery. I'd like to welcome you to address your questions via social media and I'll do my best to answer after the presentation. In today's talk on prevention in ocular melanoma, we will first review some background information about ocular melanoma. We'll talk about how improving survival can be done with prevention, how prevention can improve vision outcomes, and finally, how psychological health can be improved also with prevention. Ocular melanoma is known by several names. Ocular melanoma, uveal melanoma, choroidal melanoma, all refer to intraocular cancer in the eye. Although it is rare, it is the most common primary intraocular tumor of adults. Approximately five to six cases per year per million occur. That is about 2,100 new patients diagnosed with ocular melanoma in the United States. Although there have been many studies looking for possible associations of how melanoma may form, there have been no associated risk factors identified. Epidemiological studies have shown us that people with blue or green eyes may develop ocular melanoma more often than people with brown eyes. And we do see more cases of ocular melanoma in people with less pigmentation of their skin. Here's a diagram of the cross-section of the eye. The white area here is the lens of the eye, which forms a cataract as we grow older. Everything to the right of this is called the anterior chamber, where the cornea, the aqueous humor, and the lens are part of. Everything to this side we call the posterior segment. The posterior segment contains the vitreous humor, which is the clear substance around which the eye developed, and it also contains the retina, which is like lining of the inner eye wall against the sclera, which is the coat of the eye. Here is the optic nerve where all the retinal nerve fiber layers come together and go to the brain and give us our vision. This brown spot down here is a possible location of an ocular melanoma. The melanoma forms underneath the retina from tissues in the choroid layer. Here is a photograph of an eye that has been removed or enucleated. You can see that the melanoma is mushroom shaped, which is a typical appearance of a larger sized tumor. You can also see that the retina, which is normally flat against the back of the eye wall, is detached. We often see retinal detachment in association with choroidal melanoma. How is ocular melanoma diagnosed? Well, there are several ways. First, melanoma of the eye can be detected by routine eye examination. A person looks in the eye that is dilated and finds a pigmented tumor. Today, many people have retinal photographs taken for screening purposes, and this may be one way that we can find unusual or abnormal pigmented spots of the back of the eye. We do see a lot of patients that have had photographs taken and there is something unusual in it and we evaluate these people to make sure they don't have melanoma or other ocular abnormalities. Secondly, a patient with a melanoma may have altered vision. The tumor itself may form in a location of the eye that they will notice, such as the macula, which is a part of the retina responsible for central sight. A person may also notice a blind spot caused by the melanoma, which doesn't go away and begins to be more persistent. 
In addition, a person may notice flashes of light or some new flickering that begins to develop. And this may be reason why a person goes to see their eye care provider for an examination. Finally, a person may know that they already have a pigmented spot in the eye that is benign, called a nevus or a freckle. These lesions, over time, may possibly change and turn into a malignant tumor such as melanoma, just like an unusual freckle or nevus of the skin can turn into a skin melanoma. This series of pictures shows the different appearances that an ocular melanoma might have. You can see that in each of the pictures, the tumors look a little bit different. In this one, there's, the pigmentation is fairly uniform. This melanoma has more variable pigmented with light areas in between. And you can see that in this iris melanoma, there actually appears to be no pigment at all from this view, and instead, a lot of blood vessels, which are abnormal. So you can appreciate how it may be difficult to make the correct diagnosis because of the var variable appearance of ocular melanoma. How does ocular melanoma affect patients? In two main ways. First, vision loss. The tumor itself may disrupt critical structures of the eye, such as the retina or macula, and change a person's vision. Secondly, the treatments that we use to treat the choroidal melanoma may also have side effects which may cause the vision to decline. Second, and more importantly, is metastatic death. This is when a cancer spreads beyond its primary site and goes to the rest of the body. In ocular melanoma, if the cancer ever were to spread, it tends to go to the liver, although we don't quite understand why that is the case. It is important to note that it is rare to have spread of the cancer at the time the eye melanoma is diagnosed. So let me talk to you now about prevention. Prevention isn't just limited to primary care physicians and their recommendations. There are opportunities for prevention in tertiary or quaternary care subspecialties such as ocular oncology. Prevention is important in improving survival. Prevention is important in improving vision. And prevention is very important in promoting a person's psychological health. How can we improve upon mortality? We can improve survival by treating ocular melanoma early. It is important not to watch small melanomas because with time, they only grow larger. With every increasing tumor thickness, the risk of metastasis increases. Many studies have shown that the larger the tumor is at the time it is discovered, the greater the risk of metastasis. In the largest retrospective study that was performed of over 8,000 patients over a nearly 40-year period, each millimeter of tumor thickness increase correlated with a greater risk of metastasis. We can improve for survival by performing meticulous surgery. And what does this mean exactly? What it means is that how we operate, how we treat the melanoma in the eye is critically important for survival. There is data that I will share with you that when the tumor comes back in the eye, something called local treatment failure or local tumor recurrence, this increases the rate of metastasis. A large study recently came out, published by the Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force, that showed that in people who had failure of the treatment of the primary tumor, there was a 6.28 times risk of developing metastasis than those patients who were successfully treated. And this was when size of the tumor to start with was factored out. Several years ago, we did a review looking at all published reports of treatment failure with ocular melanoma and found that the lowest rates of local recurrence were when iodine-125 brachytherapy was used together with ultrasound-guided localization. And what does this mean? This means that when at the time of the melanoma surgery, 
the ultrasonographer comes to the operating room and confirms that that radiation treatment is properly covering the tumor. That way, we can avoid and lower the risk of recurrences. We also found that there was significant variation in local recurrence rates between centers. And here is a paper of ours that looked at the importance of ultrasound localization during surgery. And in this series, we did not have any local treatment failures. How can we prevent vision loss? If preventing mortality is the most important, the next most important thing is sight. We can reduce the radiation exposure from the outset by shielding the non-tumor tissue in the eye. We can observe early after treatment for signs of radiation vasculopathy, of signs of damage to the vessels. We also must be vigilant in detecting and treating other ocular comorbidities. What that means is that an eye with a melanoma may develop a cataract or develop glaucoma, conditions that we have excellent treatments for. But sometimes we see that so much attention is focused on the melanoma that we forget about the simpler things there are to treat in the eye. What is radiation retinopathy? This is a predictable fundus-wide vascular incompetence from radiation exposure of any sort, whether it's plaque or proton therapy. And by pan fundus, that means it affects the entire back of the eye, the entire retina. The collaborative ocular melanoma study, which is now an older study, which was where we randomized patients to removal of the eye and brachytherapy, showed that in the people who underwent brachytherapy, nearly half of those had vision worse than 20, 2200 in the treated eye. So radiation retinopathy is a potentially serious cause of loss of vision. What are some of the features that we see in radiation retinopathy? And this picture here depicts some of the major ones. Let me point out that this is the tumor that has been treated, and this tumor is now dead. But now we see in the macula, which is where the part of the eye that's responsible for central vision, there are these little white areas, and those are infarcts or damage to the nerve fiber layer, and all sorts of little dots of hemorrhage, and this yellow exudate, which leaks out of the small vessels because these vessels are now and they are now compromised, and so they're leaky. So we see cotton wool spots, those white things, exudation, macular edema, where we actually see the fluid that's caused by the leaking vessels. We see retinal neovascularization, and what that means is new vessels are forming because the eye is struggling to overcome some of the side effects. However, these new blood vessels are problematic, and they are prone to bleeding, so a person may develop a vitreous hemorrhage where the eye may fill with blood. And ultimately, the patient may develop neovascular glaucoma. And that is when there are so many new vessels growing that they actually start to grow in the front of the eye and block the drainage channels that help control intraocular pressure. So the pressure of the eye goes up very high. And this can be very painful for people. So let me tell you about some strategies for prevention at UCLA. What I've just shown you with the pictures of radiation retinopathy, we don't have good treatments for. There are injections of drugs that we can put into the eye, but these rarely are helpful for people in the long run. So in the absence of good treatments, we need prevention. So at UCLA, we have developed a way to shield the non-tumor tissue parts of the eye by using silicone oil. And how does this work? When we treat a melanoma, we put the plaque on the outside of the eye to cover the tumor. In addition to radiating the tumor, there are some radiation rays that affect the healthy non-tumor parts of the eye, causing radiation retinopathy. If we can replace the vitreous humor, which fills the inside of the eyeball, with a substance that will block the radiation from going anywhere, we can perhaps limit the radiation that goes elsewhere in the eye. And this is how the idea of silicon oil works. 
We first showed this back in 2010 when we looked at a series of, of substances that we use in the operating room, including silicone oil, and showed that we can block the radiation by 50 to 60 percent. We also showed that in a series of patients who had the oil procedure and those who had standard plaque, those who had the oil surgery had less radiation retinopathy. And in our latest study, we looked at very large tumors because those would be the eyes that we use the most radiation for and that we would expect to see the most difference in radiation shielding. And we found that at two years, vision was significantly better in eyes that had received the silicone oil with plaque than in those eyes that had received the plaque treatment alone. Let me share with you a graph that is part of this publication that I think is very important. To the left are good vision outcomes and to the right are poor vision outcomes. The blue bars represent plaque treatment alone. The red bars represent plaque with silicone oil. And you can see that there are far more eyes that have good vision outcomes when we use the silicone oil to shield the radiation than if we use plaque alone. And if we look at poor vision outcomes, because this is an important subset of vision to evaluate, we see that the, using the silicone oil results in less poor vision outcomes compared to standard plaque therapy. But what else can we do to improve what we're already doing now at UCLA? We have recently found that we may have something better than our iodine-125 radiation, which is currently the gold standard at most institutions. We, sh we have shown that the silicone oil can block the radiation by 50 to 60 percent. We have some new data that shows that if we use palladium-103, which is another radioisotope very similar to iodine-125, we may be able to block the radiation by at least 75 percent because palladium-103 has a greater photoelectric attenuation, which means that the palladium is more easily blocked than iodine is. And here's a graph showing this data. And the purple line represents iodine by itself, and the red line indicates the palladium with silicon oil, showing a reduction in radiation exposure. So what else can we do to prevent vision loss? Our prevention doesn't just end when we treat the melanoma. Prevention is important even when we are following patients who have been treated. It is important that when patients come for follow-up visits that we first make sure that the tumor has responded, that that melanoma is dead and treated. Next, it is important to look carefully for radiation retinopathy. We have recently shown that radiation retinopathy, as shown in this picture here, that radiation affects the whole fundus and we have developed a grading scheme where we can measure how much radiation retinopathy has occurred in a patient. And we have shown that there are very early signs of radiation retinopathy that can occur before the vision is affected. If we can detect these things early, we may be able to intervene rather than waiting till an eye has developed something like neovascular glaucoma. But we need to look carefully, otherwise we can miss this. There are also, it is also important to look for other comorbidities. We have recently shown with our glaucoma service that glaucoma occurs with an incidence of 8.6 percent in patients who have undergone brachytherapy for melanoma treatment. And it is important that if the pressure starts to rise that this be treated very strongly because as I said earlier glaucoma is a condition where we have excellent treatments for. And of course we can't forget about the fellow eye. We must look carefully at the eye that was not affected. We have a tendency, a tendency to focus on the melanoma eye in, in quite great detail because a lot has happened. But we must remember to look carefully at the good eye because, again, an eye can have other things that are easily treatable and we need to detect any abnormalities there for good vision. So mortality and vision aside, what about the psychological health of the patient? Each person who has a melanoma comes to us with their own set of circumstances and issues that they are dealing with. Together with our partners in the health psychology department, we have shown that patients want information, even if it doesn't affect 
the treatment, their medical treatment that they may undergo. And this we found when we started to offer biopsy for patients to determine whether their cancers were high risk or not. And we found that our patients wanted this information, and so that drove us further. We have also shown that when people have unmet quality of life issues, when there are concerns that are not properly addressed, the quality of life of these patients may be less. And we have shown this in a subset of ocular melanoma patients. So as we would expect as in other types of cancer and diseases, it is very important in ocular melanoma as well. Most recently, we have published prospective data on ocular melanoma patients and described their psychological concerns. And it is this prospective data that we will continue to report on as we better understand how to help patients cope with their diagnosis of ocular melanoma. So why is it important to study psychologic interventions? And many times in the medical field, we focus on the disease and the treatments, but it's very important to focus on what a person goes through. And this is because appropriate counseling for some of, of the people's concerns, it can reduce depression and anxiety and may result in better health. Over many years, people have looked at the effects of stress and depression on cancer progression, and there are studies that show that depression is a risk factor for cancer progression. So potentially, can psychosocial interventions reduce metastasis? There are some patients who we see with ocular melanoma with high risk features who ha are doing very well many years later, over a decade later. And this is a little counterintuitive to what we might expect. But perhaps there are other variables that we need to focus on, particularly as it relates to the patient. So to summarize our session on prevention, we've reviewed some of the basics of ocular melanoma. We have talked about how prevention can improve survival, how prevention can improve vision outcomes, and how prevention has an important role in improving the psychological health of patients. Thank you very much for your attention and for joining us at this webinar. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to address. Thank you. So the first question is, when do you need to remove ocular melanoma? So this refers to the surgery called a nucleation, when we, ha we take the whole eye out. And usually, we reserve this for people who have very large tumors and very poor vision. So that if we try to save the eye, a person doesn't really benefit because there is no sight left. So we recommend removal of the eye when a person has a large tumor with poor vision. The next question is, are visual disturbances always seen with this type of cancer? Or can you have no visual symptoms until it's too late? So it is unfortunately true that it is possible that the melanoma may have no symptoms at all. And by the time it manifests itself with visual symptoms, it is quite large and can take over much of the inside of the eye. We see this in tumors that are in the ciliary body. And that part of the eye is in the far periphery, just behind where the iris ends and the, and the retina begins. And it's very hard to visualize that area on exam. And also, that part of the retina does not affect a person's vision. So it is possible that a melanoma may grow and not give any symptoms. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for joining us at our webinar. <laughs>